Welcome to U.S. History 2, Week 4, entitled From Polish to Rust, The Great Depression. I'd like to start this whole lecture on the Great Depression from a wonderful uh, quote from Amity Schley's The Forgotten Man, A New History of the Great Depression. She states, American capitalism did not break in 1929. The crash did not cause the Depression. And the crash to which he re is referring is the stock market crash of October 1929 that typically people say was the cause of the Depression, but it was really just kind of an immediate cause. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. There were overall causes of the Depression, and especially of the Depression's long duration from 1929 to nearly 1940, and we'll examine those first. First of all, there was great inequity of wealth uh, at the beginning of the Great Depression. For decades, farmers in the United States and elsewhere had been receiving very low prices for their farm produce. Added to a great debt that they were building up, um, this led to low incomes for farmers. Industrial workers were really faring no better. Their wages did not keep up with corporate profit and with increasing productivity. That meant that on the eve of the Great Depression, nearly two-thirds of all American families lived on less than $2,000 per year. And economists have estimated that $2,000 a year at that time would have supplied only basic necessities. In sharp contrast, the top 1% of income uh, receivers in the United States took away 15% of the nation's income. Now, that was problematic because, number one, the inequity of wealth led directly to, number two, credit problems. That is, the top 1% and even those below, the wealthy only needed so many cars and so many radios and so many other consumer goods. And so the supply for those goods uh, would be driven down unless you could get middle class consumers to buy those goods on credit, which of course was what was occurring. By the end of the 1920s, four out of every five cars and two out of every three radios were being bought on credit. Personal indebtedness rose to an all-time high and it was not sustainable. That's all you needed is the uh, weather, the climate, not to um, be good either and the, the situation would, would, would be getting worse. There were long-standing agricultural problems. As the country went from transitioning from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy, as bad weather and droughts arose and the so-called Dust Bowl um, emerged, of which John Steinbeck wrote in his 1939 classic, The Grapes of Wrath. There were other problems occurring as well in the heart of the Depression, such as the great 1937 flood along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. All of these things occurring at a time when people were uh, already impoverished. Number four, there were international economic problems. You remember that Germany, after World War I, was stuck with some very heavy war reparations, which caused some... Um, very bad problems in Europe with hyperinflation. Uh, Herbert Hoover, President Herbert Hoover uh, himself thought that uh, at the time the reparations uh, required of Germany were a very bad idea. There were also high U.S. tariffs. So one of the highest tariffs ever passed was done so in 1930 at the beginning of the Great Depression. It was called the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act. It raised U.S. tariffs to an historic high, meaning that uh, there would be tariffs on products imported to the United States. This just triggered an international tariff war. So it was, a, it was an example of protectionism, not uh, the total opposite of free trade. The United States raised its tariffs against foreign goods, and foreign countries in turn retaliated by raising their tariffs, and so international 
economic problems arose. There were all kinds of corporate structural problems as well. Holding companies, investment trust, leverage, the selling of stock, the buying of stock on margin, all kinds of speculation, which we're now going to explain a little bit more as we talk a little bit about the kind of immediate cause or the trigger, the straw that broke the camel's back, that is the stock market crash, also called Black Tuesday, October 29th. 1929. The causes of this were really speculation. Investors like you and me, common people, were speculating in the stock market, which drove up prices and led to a kind of a bubble economy. The prices of the stocks were only going to go so far, and at some point in time, the bubble would eventually burst. In fall of 1929, Bankers throughout the United States shored up the buying of stocks, but it was only a temporary solution. It was merely a band-aid. Besides this kind of speculation of just lots of people buying stocks, they were doing so by buying them, many of them, on margin. That, in, that is, investors like you and me, common people, were buying stocks with just a fraction of the money, of the cost of the stock, just a fraction down. In some instances, as low as only 10%. Now, that seems almost impossible to us today, and of course, today is much more regulated, but back then it really wasn't regulated at all. So that meant that a person could, could go out, and I'm going to use an example, and buy a $1 stock with only 10 cents. The other 90 cents would be essentially loaned to them to buy the stock, and it would be loaned to them by the investment banker, the brokerage house, you know, whoever was selling them the stock. Now, all of this would work out just fine as long as the stock retained its price. So if you could turn around and maybe in a few months resell the stock for $1.20, you could not only pay off the 10% you paid, the 10 cents you paid for it, but the 90% that you owed that you essentially loaned from the stockbroker, you know, the brokerage house, the investment house, the investment bank, or whatever. Um, and you'd still have a little bit of money left over. But what if, in fact, the stock market price didn't even remain the same, but actually decreased? What happens if it decreased down to, say, 70 cents? Well, in that case, you might have actually had, uh, and did probably have if you were buying on margin, and buying on margin literally means you didn't have, you just had a marginal amount, uh, a margin, a percentage of the real cost of the stock. So you usually had something in your contract that would say, say, for instance, if the stock went down to 70%, of what it was worth, that the bank or whoever was holding your loan would come back to you and say, okay, I'm going to insist on a margin call. That is, I'm going to require you to put up some more money. So let's use that example of the $1 stock. It goes down to 70 cents, so maybe they say, okay, you need to put up another 30 cents now because the, 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 the price uh, of the stock has gone down and we need some of our money now. Now, maybe you didn't have 30 cents, right, for each of those $1 stocks that you bought. Uh, if you did, fine and dandy, you've still lost. You've still lost 30 cents in essence because the stock price is going down. If you didn't have the 30 cents, then you really had to start selling those $1 stocks for 70 cents so that at least you could pay back some of what you owed um, to um, the uh, bank or the brokerage house, the investment house, whoever was holding um, the loan on your margin. Well, see then, if a bunch of people go selling stocks, that floods the market with more stocks, which means the stocks go on this vicious cycle of, and it's just a steady, precipitous fall of more and more stocks, less and the stock prices are falling, and people don't have the money to buy them, and one thing leads to another. Now, buying on mar margin is an example of the second cause, which is leverage.
Leverage um, is looking at it, but well, we're going to look at it instead of, say, from the common person buying stock and buying on margin. Now we're going to kind of look at it from the, the other end of the corporation that's trying to raise capital, it's trying to raise money so that it maybe can hire some more employees, it can buy some more equipment, it can increase production, maybe build a new factory, whatever it needs for. How does it get that money? Well, corporations usually issue stocks, right? So you can own a, literally a portion of that corporation that is the stockholder's own stock in the company, in the corporation. And there's usually a couple kinds of stock. There's usually preferred stockholders who always get paid first. And then common stockholders where um, they'll be the ones who will be the last to be paid. So in order to gain money, capital, to build up their corporations and their companies, uh, corporations will sometimes issue more stock. Okay, so they're issuing more stock, which brings in people who buy that stock, which brings in capital. They could also um, just simply go ahead and borrow some money from a bank. And then there could be investment trusts which arise, which were literally holding companies that held stock in other companies in a pyramid-like effect, and they would be buying up stocks in a particular company. So what you have is literally leveraging funds, leveraging um, capital through a variety of credit arrangements all of which are kind of pyramid-like and build on one another. And as long as the system all holds together, uh, much like, uh, you know, stock prices continue to rise, everybody's happy, stock prices continue to fall, loans are due, and everything begins to fall apart. So just showing you from the Wall Street Journal Guide to Understanding Money from 1993, of course things had certainly changed by that in terms of the regulations by the US government. But let's just say this just shows you how a margin works. You buy $5,000 uh, worth of stock and your broker invests $5,000 so you're buying on margin. Everything's okay as long as the stock price rises if the stock price drops, uh, then you may get a margin call from your brokerage firm to uh, make up the difference. Leverage, and I like this very much also from the Wall Street Journal Guide to Understanding Money and Investing because it literally shows the physics principle behind all of it. Here's this little guy. He's invested $3,500 and it ends up buying $35,000 for him as long as all the leveraging and everything goes okay and the stock prices continue and the company makes money, et cetera, et cetera. And if any of that falls apart, well, then everything else is simply going to fall apart as well. When the selling price of stocks began their precipitous decline in autumn of 1929, investors could not meet the margin calls or repay their loans. And sometimes um, their positions, uh, their, their stocks were um, automatically sold. Those able to sell better priced stocks did so, and that in turn flooded the market with more stock, uh, further driving down prices. And as I said before, it was a vicious circle. Uh, things really, the stock market entered uh, a free fall at that time. And there was really no way to kind of shore it up, although some of the bankers did try to. Well, who is president of the time and what kind of a man is the president? In August of 1928, the election of 1928, Herbert Hoover said, we in America today are nearer to the final triumph over poverty, over poverty than ever before in the history of any land. The poorhouse is vanishing from among us. Only 15 months later, however, those words would haunt him as the nation plunged into the most prolonged and the most severe economic depression in its history. Herbert Hoover wasn't a bad man. He was an engineer. He was compassionate. He was very organized, and he was even a hero of his day. At the end of World War I, he was a food administrator for the U.S. government. 
he organized the very successful efforts to, feel, to feed the starving hungry in Belgium after World War I. As Commerce Secretary under President Coolidge, he oversaw successful relief efforts during the flood of 1927 along the Mississippi River. He was also the man to put together the cooperation of seven states to build what became known and what was named after him as Hoover Dam. Times were good. In 1925, unemployment was only 3.2 percent. Hoover himself did not like all of the stock market speculation going on. He thought that buying stock on margins was a bad policy. The Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon was President Coolidge's favorite, however, so really uh, Coolidge wasn't paying much attention to what Hoover had to say. So Hoover became president in 1929, and he first, tar he first tried to jumpstart the economy by persuading businessmen not to cut production, um, don't drop wages, don't lay off workers, etc. Well, needless to say, that voluntary effort really didn't work. So he proposed an increase in the federal budget to be used for a new public federal public works program. So he wanted to build things like new federal buildings and just kind of jumpstart the economy and get people working again. He saw this as a temporary measure and he hoped when the economic climate uh, would improve, it would, it would not be um, uh, necessary to continue this. Um, and he was certainly afraid of the federal budget getting out of control. He, wanted, he didn't want to see things become insolvent. And um, he also created the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was the also called the RFC. And it was a government agency whose purpose was to provide loans, federal loans, to banks and railroads and other businesses that were troubled, that were on the point of bankruptcy. Um, the RFC was not allowed to purchase stock or provide capital to these trouble institutions. And that's really what they need needed. It was only allowed to loan money. And simply putting it, there was not enough money that the who any of the Hoover programs spent that could really solve the depth of where the economy was going in terms of the depression. And so literally little camps, shanty towns, uh, along all across the nation arose. Unemployed men began riding the rails as hobos looking for work. People and families were living in shanty towns and some people began to deridedly refer to those shanty towns as Hoovervilles. In 1932, in a very sad mood, move veterans of World War I um, who were promised a uh, money bonus in 1945, uh, so they became known as the Bonus Army, said, well, you know, that bonus we were promised for, for, for helping to win World War I, we really need it now, not 1945. So they marched to Washington to a camp and set up in Washington, D.C., and Hoover sent in General Douglas MacArthur, who dispersed and burned down the uh, camp drown of the Bonus Army. Uh, not, of course, a popular move treating veterans in such a fashion. Now, we need to just step back for a second and say that the Great Depression and the New Deal of Hoover's um, uh, you know, successor, FDR, or federal, uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, would change the way we look at remedies to poverty in the United States. 
before the Great Depression and New Deal in the 1930s, there were no federal programs for the aged, for widows, for unemployed, for handicapped, for those injured on the job, etc. There were some state programs, but mainly people relied upon, um, you know, uh, charity, charitable um, institutions and churches, etc. Um, the local officials to provide some sense of relief. In the New Deal and after, there was an increasing federal role in poverty issues. Now, the reason for this partly was due to classical economic theory. So, macroeconomists prior to the 1930s, and this comes from, from a great scholar, Bradley Schiller, in The Economy Today, thought that there could never really be a Great Depression. The economic thinkers, as he says of the time, asserted that the, the economy was inherently stable. During the 19th century and the first 30 years of the 20th century, the U.S. economy had experienced some bad years, years in which the nation's output declined and unemployment increased. But most of these episodes were relatively short-lived. The dominant feature in the industrial era was growth. The economy self-adjusts to deviations from its long-term economic trend. And so classical economists include people like Adam Smith, whose great work in 1776 was inquiry into the nation, nature and causes of the wealth of nations. This idea of laissez-faire economics to leave alone, to keep the government from getting involved in economics, to let things self-adjust on their own, that the invisible hand of the economy would fix things, that things would go in cycles. Well, the Great Depression taught one thing, and that is that the classical economic uh, theorists were, were wrong. Now, there were already attempts to get the government involved during the progressive era, of which we've already spoken. And yet that was largely after the very hard-hitting economic depression of 1893, during which unemployment reached an estimated 17 to 19 percent of the fruit workforce. So it became increasingly clear that even hard-working, frugal, and abstemious people could suffer poverty. Child saving was a progressive, progressive era attempt to keep children with worthy parents. That is to seek preservation of the family unit, not to go ahead and send them off into orphanages and other places. So to keep the family unit together, we might have to provide mothers' pensions, public health programs, child labor laws, juvenile courts, etc. So there was this idea in the progressive movement of let's save children, let's save the most innocent of those around. So the election of 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a Democrat, won versus Herbert Hoover, a Republican. And FDR, as he was called, initiated the first 100 days of the New Deal. On March 6, he declared a bank holiday, literally where all banks in the United States were to be closed. Federal examiners would come in and inspect the banks of the book, the books of the banks, and allow those solvent to reopen. The RFC could loan money to the banks. So some banks reopened and some banks that were, which were not stable did not reopen. Six days after declaring a bank holiday on March 12th to ease the nation's anxiety on Sunday night, FDR began his famous radio fireside chats, literally coming into people's homes via radio and giving them a sense of hope and optimism. Then the Glass-Steagall Banking Act, this was the second Glass-Steagall Banking Act, was passed. The first one was under Herbert Hoover. FDR's Glass-Steagall was June of 1933, and it created the Federal Deposit Insurance Company, or the FDIC, which guaranteed bank deposits to a certain amount, which meant that if you put money into a bank up to a certain amount, if something happened, the um, federal government would assure that you got your money back. FDR was also interested in seeing young men aged 18 to 25 gainfully employed, so he started the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. They worked on conservation projects in rural areas, doing things like building park trails and cabins, 
uh, for state uh, parks and other uh, kinds of national parks, fixing soil erosion problems, reforesting forests, etc. It employed at, at about 250,000 young men. And then there was passed the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which established the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, called the AAA. This was May of 1933. The idea was to control agricultural production in order to prop up prices. So literally, it paid farmers subsidies to reduce production. For instance, it placed limits on tobacco so that the cost of tobacco would remain high enough that the farmers could make a living wage. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court declared the AAA unconstitutional. But FDR got around it by getting new legislation passed that allowed the government to pay farmers subsidies to reduce production for reasons of soil conservation and other such things. In May of 1933, the Tennessee Valley Authority was created for the damming of rivers, um, and uh, that was in the area of Kentucky, Tennessee, and Appalachia. Uh, they did this for a number of different reasons, for flood control, for hydroelectric plot power, for recreation. So an example of this would be Lake Cumberland, Kentucky. The Federal Emergency Relief Administration, or FARA, May 1933, would be directed by Harry Hopkins on the federal level. It provided cash grants, grants, not loans, to states for both work relief and direct relief. Direct relief would be things like cash payments, grocery orders, etc. It ceased production in, in operations in December 1935, and by then it had provided over $3 billion in aid and helped employ 20 million people. For the coming winter of 1933-34, it began the Civil Works Administration, of 1933, federal work relief, that is literally a federal government payroll for construction of schools, roads, parks, playgrounds, etc. Both FERA and CWA were meant to be temporary solutions. That's why they were dismantled later. There was also a Securities Act of May 1933 telling those that who were selling stocks that they had to provide information about those securities. And then there was the National Industrial Recovery Act, or NIRA, June of 1933. It was headed by a new federal agency called the National Recovery Administration that asked businesses to provide a minimum wage of 30 to 40 cents per hour, a maximum work week of 35 to 40 hours, etc. Cooperating businesses would display the NRA Blue Eagle sign in their shop windows. FDR asked industries to cooperate in instituting blanket codes for prices and wages so as to not undercut one another to stabilize employment and to counter deflation. The NRA charter also recognized the right of workers to form unions and to bargain collectively. And the NIRA also established the Public Works Administration, or the PWA of 1933, that loaned money to cities and states for public works projects, but did no construction themselves. And 1935, the U.S. Supreme Court would declare the NIRA unconstitutional and the NRA ceased operations. So these were the programs of the so-called first hundred days. They also included a farm credit administration and a homeowner's own corporation to provide for the refinancing of uh, mortgages. The 100 days ended. In 1935, a federal housing administration was established to ensure low interest mortgages that guaranteed to pay the lender if the homeowner defaulted. Between 1938 and 41, FHA insured mortgages comprised 34% of new home mortgages. And the FHA, of course, is still around as well as 1934's Security and Exchange Commission to oversee the stock market. In 1934, one and a half million workers went on strike, including the longshoremen of the Pacific and a general strike in San Francisco, Teamsters struck in Minneapolis, etc and textile workers in the South, all for fair wages, etc. The second New Deal really occurred in 1935 and after, 
and for really a series of different reasons. Already there was opposition arising from the United States Supreme Court and from other people who felt that either um, if the Supreme Court felt that um, FDR had gone too far, other people felt that FDR was not going far enough. Um, we'll see what happens. So by 1935, the New Deal had many problems. The U.S. Supreme Court that year declared the NIRA unconstitutional and the NRA ceased operation. The economy did not seem much better. 20% of the people in the United States were still unemployed. And number three, there were many critics. They included Dr. Francis Townshend of California, who proposed a federal pension plan for Americans over the age of 60. That would later on be picked up by the FDR's administration and become something a little different, which we call now Social Security. Then in Michigan, you had Father Charles Coughlin, a Catholic priest, the so-called radio priest, who called for economic justice going so far as to say that the banking system ought to be nationalized, that is, taking over, taken over by the federal government. Then you had Huey B. Long, the kingfish of Louisiana, a former governor of Louisiana, and then a U.S. senator for, from Louisiana. Huey B. Long fought the power of big businesses and banks. He founded the Share Our Wealth Society, in which he proposed a massive redistribution of wealth. He wanted the federal government to tax the rich heavily as, as well as to tax inheritances. He wanted them to confiscate family fortunes over $5 million, to put a 100% tax on incomes of over a million dollars per year, and to assure that each family would have a house, a car, and an assured an annual income. Well, all of these things are coming, all these people and all of these ideas are coming from different venues. And in the midst of it, um, FDR and the Congress have to make all kinds of decisions. The National Labor Relations Act, also called the Wagner Act of 1935, was necessary because the NIRA had been declared unconstitutional. It created a National Labor Relations Board NLRB to ensure compliance, giving workers the right to unionize and to engage in collective bargaining. Social Security Act, you guys already know about that, 1935, a social insurance pro program providing benefits for the retired, the unemployed, the blind, handicapped, and dependent children. Aid to Dependent Children, or AID, later on named ADC, uh, was 1936. It too was a part of Social Security. Then there was the Works Progress Administration, later on renamed the Works Projects Administration, 1935, renamed in 1939, directed by Harry Hopkins on the federal level. Between 1935 and 42, the WPA spent over $15 billion in building new schools, sewers, post offices, highways, roads, bridges, and streets across the United States. It also employed writers and artists and musicians in all kinds of public projects, even archivists and archival and cataloging projects. The National Youth Administration, or NYA, provided part-time jobs for men and women in high school and college. In 1936, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the Agricultural Adjustment Act, claiming that it was unconstitutional to pay farmers to curtail production, so Congress passed the old AAA under a new guise called the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act, whereby the federal government paid farmers to conserve soil, prevent erosion, etc., by not planting. In 1937 and uh, by 1936, um, FDR um, was reelected, and in 1937 he proposed adding six more justices to the nine justices on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, this was his attempt to pack the court. A lot of people were uh, just very frightened of the fact that FDR wanted to pack the court so he could get a court that would be supportive of his legislation. 
The Supreme Court kind of woke up about all of this and began upholding New Deal legislation rather than declaring it unconstitutional. Of course, they never um, did uh, put six more justices on to increase it to 15. Uh, that was not done. In 1938, minimum wage established the 40-hour week and outlawed child labor. And that was the end of the second New Deal. Uh, uh, next time we'll take up uh, the end of uh, the Depression, the beginning of World War II. Any questions, please feel free to email or phone me. I'm always happy to help and have a good